you can probably guess how I'm going to start. I've got some exciting news to share with you. <laughs> Carolyn Luttrell wants to place membership with us. Praise God for that. She's been visiting for several weeks. We've already grown to love her. She'll be a great asset to us. If you haven't met her, be sure to do so. Give her a big North Point welcome. It is incredible what God is doing here. So we praise him for that. Number two, Joe and Bailey were married yesterday. Yeah, praise God. It was a beautiful ceremony. They're a beautiful couple. We wish them Godspeed. And uh, I was thankful to be a part of that. And then number three, we always appreciate our visitors. It means something to us that you get up on Sunday morning and come to this place to worship with this group of people. We do not take that for granted. You don't have to come here. You choose to come here. And that means the world to me. It means the world to us. We're thankful for that. But today we have a special visitor. She's traveled almost 1,200 miles to be at North Point. Hannah Warner is here. If you haven't met Hannah, please do so. She was on countdown this morning with Caleb. She literally drove from Denver, Colorado to spend time with this church. And so we praise God for her. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for another Lord's Day. We're thankful for the victory that this day represents. You have blessed this church with so many blessings and we want to give you the glory and the thanks. We pray now that our service is a sweet-smelling sacrifice, pleasing to you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. It seems like everything has a day now, right? For instance, June 26th is Chocolate Pudding Day. August 30th is Toasted Marshmallow Day. And November the 2nd is Deviled Egg Day. Some days are more bizarre than others. You wonder, who even came up with that? April 15th, for instance, is Rubber Eraser Day. <laughs> who thought of that? May 14th is Dance Like a Chicken Day. May 31st is Speak in Sentences Day. June 1st is Hamlet Maneuver Day. September the 5th is Lazy Moms Day. October the 15th is Grouch Day. Jill, that's your birthday. <laughs> no, no correlation. <laughs> October the 31st is Knock Knock Jokes Day. Here's my favorite, probably. December the 16th is Barbie and Barney Backlash Day. <laughs> Having little ones, I kind of like that. And December the 18th is Answer Your Phone Like Buddy the Elf Day. Again, there's a day for everything. Do you know what today is? Today is National Catfish Day. Back in 1987, during a speech, Ronald Reagan declared June 25th as National Catfish Day. So if you go to a restaurant and you're wondering what to get, they have catfish, maybe that'll be the deciding factor. It's Catfish Day. But the one that really gets me is we have a day, not just one, but two actually, for what I believe to be one of the worst creatures on the planet. I can't believe that they would even have a day, much less two days. February the 1st is Serpent Day. July 16th is Snake Day. Now, is that really necessary? Does a snake need even one day, much less two? Just out of curiosity, how many people here are willing to admit they're afraid of snakes? Most people? Larry's got both hands up. <laughs> for those who didn't raise their hand, we invite you back next week for a sermon on lying. No, <laughs> just kidding. But if you fear snakes, you're in good company. A Gallup poll asked a bunch of people what they fear most, and it had several options. The number one choice was snakes. Snakes actually ranked higher than speaking in public and heights. And so a lot of people fear snakes. If you have an extreme fear of snakes, there's actually a term for that, aphidiophobia. 
If you're just terrified of snakes, if you dream about snakes in a very negative way, then maybe you suffer from a a phidiophobia. Well, today we're going to talk about a snake story. And it's going to read like a Hollywood horror movie. In fact, if Hollywood made a movie about this, people might say, you know what, that's just not realistic. But God turns fangs into favor. Rather than giving the people what they deserve, he gives them what they desire. It's a great story. The story is found in Numbers chapter 21. We're going to begin in verse 4. The children of Israel are on the move. This is during the 40 years of wilderness wandering, or wilderness wandering. This is the second generation of Israelites, and they're nearing the finish line. They're almost to the promised land. But notice what happened. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. Earlier this year, in Centennial, Colorado, a woman spent her life savings to buy a new house. It was her first house, four bedroom, two bath. Her and her kids moved in, but within just a few days, she realized, we're not alone. Snakes were living in her walls. They ended up finding ten snakes. Can you imagine? But that's nothing compared to the man in Texas who was having trouble with his cable reception. So he decided that he would go down into his crawl space to see if he could fix it. When he got into the crawl space, he noticed a large rattlesnake. He then noticed a second rattlesnake and then a third. He decided to get out of the crawl space. He called a snake removal company and he told them, quote, I have a few snakes in my house. The few snakes turned out to be 45. He had 45 rattlesnakes living in his house. Here's a picture of that. They weren't baby rattlesnakes either. And yet even that story pales in comparison to the snake infestation we're reading about today. Notice the text. The children of Israel are on the move. The Bible says they're going around the land of Edom. Now this was an annoyance. This was an inconvenience. They weren't allowed to go through the land, so they're having to make this big detour around it. And as they're traveling, they get frustrated. The Bible says the people became impatient. Now put yourself in their sandals. You've been living in tents in the wilderness for forever. You're eating the same monotonous diet day after day. Moses keeps telling you, I'm taking you to a land of milk and honey. But you haven't seen it yet. You just keep wandering through the wilderness. And now you're you're having to detour yet again. And so the people became impatient. They were aggravated. They were irritated. One translation says their tempers grew short. I'm not excusing that. But as a human, I'm kind of sympathetic to it. Well, what did they do? They began lashing out. Their impatience boiled over. They began to speak against God and against Moses. That was a twofold sin. It was a sin to rail against God. It is also a sin to rail against God's servant. And that's what they were doing. They cried out, Why have you brought us up out of the land of Egypt? Just to kill us in the wilderness? Oh, how quickly they forgot, right? In Egypt, they were slaves. They were subjected to hard labor. 
They had prayed earnestly, God, send us a deliverer. And he has. But they forgot how bad Egypt was. They're crying out against God and against Moses. We would have been better off in Egypt. Why would you bring us out here just to kill us? We don't have any food. We don't have any water. And this stuff we are eating is loathsome. It's worthless food. Wow. Do you know what food they're talking about? Manna. This was a miracle meal from heaven. In fact, in the book of Psalms, it's called the bread of angels. In the Gospel of John, this serves as a type of Jesus Christ. And so I almost shudder to even read the text. To call this miracle meal loathsome? To call it worthless food? Without God, they would have nothing. They would have starved to death a long time ago. And this wasn't just food. This was good food. It was tasty. It was nutritious. In fact, the Bible describes it as tasting like honey wafers. But they're fed up. We loathe this worthless food. Okay? God says, you don't like what I'm giving you from heaven? Let me give you something from the earth. He sent fiery serpents among the people. Now, fiery could refer to their color, but it most likely refers to their bite. Their bite burned. And the Bible says the Lord sent these fiery serpents among the people. They bit the people, and many of them died. I want you to picture this. I told you it's almost like a Hollywood horror movie, right? Here you are in your camp when suddenly you have these slithering slayers among you. These slithering slayers are coming out of crevices, curled up in corners, slithering in the sand, hissing at your heels. As you walk through the camp, you see neighbors cowering in pain, others lying motionless on the ground. Can you even imagine this scene? How are you ever going to be able to put your kids down to play? How are you ever going to get a good night's rest? Snakes are everywhere. You open the cabinet, there's a snake. You pull back the sheets, there's a snake. Can you even imagine that? Jill told me this morning, Aaron, I think we might have a mouse. I walked in my bedroom, where is that thing? If if I don't like mice, if, if I'm scared of a little creature like that, can you imagine being inundated with venomous snakes? What snake was this? We're not told, but most people surmise that this would have been the saw scaled viper. They were very prevalent in the area. They are easily agitated, and they are extremely dangerous. In fact, Zondervan Pictorial Encyclopedia describes that particular snake this way. The venom of this genus is more powerful, weight for weight, than that of any other viper. It affects the blood, breaking down the capillaries, rupturing the corpuscles, and finally causing death by massive and widespread internal hemorrhage. Again, I want you to put yourself in their sandals. I want you to envision this. Out of nowhere, here comes a a huge infestation of snakes. And not just any snake, but very, very deadly snakes. Well, if you were the people, what would you do? I think you would do exactly what they did. Notice verse 7. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he will take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. 
So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. It didn't take the people long to put two and two together, to connect the dots. Why do we have this terrible plague among us? Oh, this is God's retribution. God is punishing us. And so they immediately go to Moses and they confess, We have sinned. We are guilty. We have sinned against God and against you. Please pray to the Lord that he will take away these serpents. Not all complaining is bad. But most of it is. Legitimate complaints would be like Acts 6. Remember in the early church, some of the widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And so those neglected widows made a complaint to the apostles. That was justified, right? That was a legitimate complaint. But truthfully, most of our complaining is not justified. Well, what's wrong with complaining? First and foremost, it's a demonstration of ingratitude. When you complain about something, you are basically saying, I'm not appreciative of what I have. Complaining is controlling, contagious, counterproductive, and condemned. That's why the Bible over and over says, do not complain. And yet the children of Israel were always complaining. And God's response was often severe. In fact, are you familiar with 1 Corinthians 10 verse 9? Paul is writing to the Corinthian Christians and he says this, Do not put the Lord to the test as some of them did, and they were destroyed by serpents. He's talking about Numbers 21. Paul is telling the Corinthian Christians, hey, you remember that story about that snake infestation? Don't follow in their steps. Don't make the same mistakes they made. They were ungrateful. They complained against God and against God's servant. And they died of snake bite. Paul says, don't do that. And so, they come to Moses... They ask him to intercede. And did you notice Moses' response? He prayed for the people. A lesser man might have folded his arms and lifted his chin and said, You're just getting what you deserve. You people never learn. God put me in charge. You knew I was in charge and you had to run your mouth anyway. He could have done that, right? He could have said, I ain't praying for you. Pray for yourselves. But the Bible says that Moses was the meekest man on earth. And this is a demonstration of that. Even though he was the victim of the sin, right? He was the victim. When the people said, please pray for us, he immediately prayed for them. Back in Numbers 12, do you remember his own sister Miriam began grumbling and mumbling against him? trying to undermine his authority. As a result, God struck her with leprosy. Miriam immediately turned to Moses and said, Moses, please pray for me. Again, a lesser man might have said, well, I will in a little while. You kind of deserve that. But no, Moses immediately went to prayer. This is an example of his humility, and it's an example of his grace, right? Right? Moses wasn't seeking what they deserved. He was seeking what they desired. They desired to be saved. And so he made intercession, and the Lord responded, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. Everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, will live. I don't know about you, but that sounds a little silly. I probably wouldn't have done it that way. And maybe you're thinking, why would he want you to make a serpent, put it on a pole, and have people look at it? It doesn't matter what I think, and it doesn't matter what you think. 
Why would God tell the children of Israel to march seven times around a walled city shouting and blowing trumpets? Why would God tell a Syrian officer stricken with leprosy to dip in the Jordan River seven times? You know, there's a lot of times you might read the scriptures and say, why does God require that? The best example is baptism. How many times have you encountered people and you're sharing the gospel and you tell them now to have a right relationship with Jesus, to have your sins forgiven, you need to be immersed in water? And they say, immersed in Why would I have to get wet? I mean, that's embarrassing. That's kind of inconvenient. I just don't think I should have to do it. It doesn't matter what you think. Right? The children of Israel could have sat back and said, Well, I'm not looking at some dumb serpent that Moses created. Fine, then you'll die. Instead of wondering why God chose this and whether or not it makes sense to us, our job is to just respond in faith. God says it, that settles it. Just respond in faith. And thankfully, that's what the people did. He erected the bronze serpent, he set it on a pole, and those who looked upon it were saved. They were healed of snake bite. Now listen, the power was not in the pole, the power was not in the bronze serpent, The power was not in Moses. The power was in God. When we obey today, when we're baptized, for instance, the power is not in the water. But that's how God's grace is appropriated. The glory goes to God. The power is God's. We're just meeting the conditions of His grace. And so this horror scene becomes a scene of victory, a scene of triumph. God could have wiped out the whole camp, but instead He shows mercy. Instead of what they deserved, He gave them what they desired. And here's the parallel. In John 3, Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, a Pharisee who came to Him by night. And Jesus told Nicodemus in verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. This is really cool. I want you to get this. Jesus thinks back to Numbers 21. And He says, that was a type of me. That was a shadow of me. Just just as those people, in order to be healed, had to look upon that that was lifted up, in order for you to be healed, you must look upon that which is lifted up. Do you see the parallel? The serpent was a symbol of death, but God turned it into a symbol of life. The cross was a symbol of death, but God turned it into a symbol of life. Just as that bronze serpent was lifted up, Jesus told Nicodemus, I'm going to be lifted up. And everybody who believes me will be saved. I love this parallel. Look at the correlation. Numbers 21, their enemy was the snake. Our enemy is the snake, right? Revelation 12, verse 9. That old serpent, the devil. So their enemy was the snake. Our enemy is the snake. God's part was to provide healing through that which was lifted up. With our salvation, God's part is providing healing through that which is lifted up. And their part was simply to respond in faith to that which was lifted up. Our part is the same. We respond in faith to that which was lifted up. Do you see that? When you read Numbers 21, you should see Jesus Christ all over that. It's a foreshadowing of what was to come. But here's my question to you. Do you see yourselves as a snake-bitten Israelite? Do you? Like, think about that. 
Do you see yourselves as a snake-bitten Israelite? You say, well, probably not. We may not have the venomous poison of a real snake bite coursing through our bodies, but we have been snake bitten. We have the venomous poison of sin coursing through our souls. And left to ourselves, we're doomed to die. There's nothing we can do about it. Like those Israelites, we're infected. I know it's, it's, it's harming me, and it'll ultimately lead to death, but there's nothing I can do about it. Don't you see spiritually it's the same for sinners? Before you come to Jesus Christ, it's as if you've been bitten, and you have been. It's as if you have the sin of this venomous poison flowing through your veins, harming your body, and ultimately leading to death. What's the anti-venom? That which God has lifted up. That symbol of death is now a symbol of life. What once represented doom and despair now represents hope. I look at the world and I see people going about their their day, right? Going to work, going out to eat, fishing, hunting, watching their favorite television shows. And that's great, except they're missing the main point. Right? Like they're missing the main point. You've been infected. And there's only one remedy. There's only one antivenom. You can never heal yourself. Left in this condition, you're doomed to die. Don't you get that? There's only one antivenom. And that's Jesus Christ. Just as that bronze serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, he was lifted up on Calvary. And just as they had to respond in faith, we have to respond in faith. It hurts me knowing that so many people are lost, they're doomed to die and do nothing about it. Reading Numbers 21, everybody would say they'd be dumb not to look upon that serpent. Well, if I may, you'd be dumb not to look upon Jesus Christ. He too was lifted up for your deliverance. He was lifted up for your healing. The question is, what are you going to do about that? Maybe for the very first time you're realizing, man, I am in a bad state. If I don't do something, I am going to be lost. Well, there's no better time than this time to change. Come believing in Jesus with all of your heart. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith and be immersed in water. Why do I got to get wet? Why did they have to build a serpent? Because God says so. Just do it. And if you look upon the one who was lifted up 2,000 years ago, You can look forward to the time when you will be lifted up forever. You don't have to die in that condition. God has provided a way. Just respond in faith. If you're ready to do that, we're ready to help you do that. Please come as we stand and sing.